Chapter 6 kicks off with an intense showdown against the Supreme Inspector, a boss that stands out for being one of the most prolonged and difficult encounters in the game. His vast health pool and relentless assault make this fight a true challenge. Interestingly, you can summon the Supreme Inspector as early as Chapter 4 by gathering all four purple talismans. The fight continues until he drops to half health, triggering a cutscene that concludes the battle. Monkey, no matter how many times you reincarnate, you're still blind to the ways of this world. Now, in your folly, you've hindered the dealings of the court. But above that, you've given a girl who knows no limits of false hope. <laughs> I shall transform her into a mighty golden pill and uh, keep it safe for you. Think about her, won't you? Should you feel like stirring trouble in your next life? After you reach the Verdant Path Keeper Shrine in Chapter 6, you'll face the Supreme Inspector once more. Conquering him will earn you the Somersault Cloud Spell. Be prepared for a lengthy battle, as his ability to fly allows him to evade your attacks for extended periods. Combined with his large HP pool, this fight can take a considerable amount of time to finish. The best tactic is to immobilize him whenever you can, as this will stop him from taking to the skies and launching his aerial assaults. Also, if you find yourself in a tight spot when he conjures a circle of fire to ensnare you, you can use the plantain fan to douse the flames and regain control of the fight. Have the gall to show up! If you come at me now, this day will be your last!
Jude's gift it is! It's Wukong's somersault cloud! <laughs> I was wringing my brain out to fetch you, but this savvy one's already on it! <laughs> it must have been hidden here amongst the mist until it sensed the relics on you. Thanks to them, it recalled its master and saved your skin. Now that it answers to your call, why not make good use of it? <laughs> your mortal body is too heavy for me in my wind form. <laughs> <laughs> All these henchmen of the court! What draws them to this mountain? Let's find out! To effectively defeat the gold-armored rhino, your primary goal should be to shatter its horn. When you manage to break it, the creature will be incapacitated for a significant duration, allowing you to unleash your attacks without restraint. Therefore, always focus on targeting its horn. Be cautious though, when the horn is on the verge of regrowth, the rhino will let out a roar and call down a flurry of lightning bolts. As soon as you hear that roar, retreat swiftly to avoid being struck by the bolts.
Gold sought the armor. That monkey was full of surprises, just like me. He had his way to linger on, and his belongings, too. They're set on killing those mongrels of a court. But we've got to snatch them first, or these scum will take them. I'll go find the other ones. Keep up with me. Yeah. At last, we meet a frog boss that brings a real challenge to the table. Lang Ba Ba employs all the familiar froggy tactics, including his tongue lash and backward kick, but he shakes things up with his stone skin, which effectively blocks your melee attacks. While you can still inflict damage, it's minimal and hardly worth the effort. The key to victory lies in patiently waiting for his stone form to wear off, and then striking hard when he becomes vulnerable again.
In the foothills region, you'll encounter numerous waterwood beasts, but only one stands out as the true waterwood beast boss, lurking behind the mantis-catching swamp shrine. This formidable foe is tougher than you might anticipate. Towering over its smaller counterparts, it poses a significant threat, and its somewhat awkward hitbox around its mouth adds an extra layer of challenge. When it's submerged, its attacks can inflict massive damage, so employing abilities like Cloud Step or Rock Solid is wise to mitigate that risk. Position yourself near the beast's hind legs while it's above water, and use Immobilize to unleash a flurry of uninterrupted attacks. With enough hits, you'll stagger it, paving the way for even more damage until you claim victory. Following the Supreme Inspector, Zhao Lung feels like a refreshing change of pace. In other words, he's straightforward and manageable. With low health and predictable attacks, he can be easily overwhelmed. You can approach him in any way you prefer. I found success by rapidly chipping away at his health using a powerful mix of spells and transformations.
The Fangtail General is an enormous beetle that can be spotted leaping from one location to another across the Chapter 6 map at regular intervals, creating a tremor that shakes the entire screen if you're in close proximity. This boss stands out because it presents more of a skill check puzzle rather than a traditional battle. You can't inflict damage on the Fengtail General in the usual way. Instead, you must utilize the Somersault Cloud to land on its back. Once there, interact with the antennae on its head to hang on while it performs three consecutive jumps. This challenge tests your stamina. If it runs out during the jumps, you'll fall off and need to restart. To succeed, you'll need approximately 300 stamina. Following your third jump, you'll need to engage with the antennae again for another skill check that tests your health. As you grip the antennae, they will burn you, gradually reducing your health. You must endure the entire skill check without depleting your health completely, or you will perish. A significant amount of HP or solid scorch resistance is crucial to succeed, but there's a more straightforward option. Activate the fireproof mantle just before the second skill check, and you'll be shielded from the flames. Completing this challenge will enable you to defeat the Fengtail General. Silly strands, you're all the more like Wukong. Just don't prance around with your might as he did. <sighs> that monkey's got a stash of treasures. I'll scout around some more. <laughs> The Cloud Treading Deer stands as the initial boss you must defeat among the four necessary to collect the pieces of Sun Wukong's armor, a crucial step toward facing the final adversary. Interestingly, the first phase of this encounter proves to be tougher than the second, primarily due to the relentless whirlwinds that pursue you, inflicting significant damage if they make contact. After you whittle down his first health bar, he transitions into a second phase, swapping out the whirlwinds and frost for toxic blood pools and projectiles. Thankfully, these attacks are considerably easier to manage. Thank <laughs> you. 
Fine then, fine. With you monkeys around, I'm always toiling away for nothing. <sighs> Kid, when you step up one day, try not to forget your Uncle Bajir. All I got from Wukong were the nasty jobs. You should do better than that. <sighs> now we're done here. Time to move on. <laughs> Before you can challenge the final boss of the game, you must first defeat the Emerald Armed Mantis, the last of the required bosses. This creature only appears after you have triumphed over the Cloud Treading Deer, the Gold Armored Rhino, and the Fung Tail General. The battle takes place in the unusual arena of Zhubaji's stomach, where the Mantis rapidly showcases its signature, the long and lethal combo attacks. As its health decreases to around two-thirds, these attacks will become even longer and even more dangerous. To counter this, skills like Cloud Step and Rock Solid are incredibly effective at breaking the Mantis's attack pattern, making him vulnerable to heavy damage. If you encounter difficulties, activating your transformation always can grant you a moment of safety. But overall, this encounter should not pose much of a challenge after dealing with the Supreme Inspector and the Cloud Treading Deer.
I owe you once more for saving my rump. My belly's not too vile, is it? I'm not a meat eater after all. I hope it didn't repulse you. Well, you fetched it. It wasn't all that bad, eh? <laughs> now that Wukong's armor set is complete, we should go to Water Curtain Cave. Come with me. As soon as you strike, Son of Stones will make a couple of swipes behind him before acknowledging you as a worthy nuisance and turning around. When he rises, you can go to town on his legs while sidestepping his slow but powerful attacks, much like you would with any other hefty Black Myth boss. Don't waste your time with Immobilize, it simply won't work on him. Instead, watch for his large lightning area of effect strike. Dodging the lightning is quite manageable and it gives you a golden opportunity because Son of Stones will be down for a moment, winded. This is your chance to deliver a charged heavy attack or two. Hidden within the foothills of Chapter 6 are four Poison Chief mini-bosses, each cleverly camouflaged as large rock formations. Spotting them can be quite a challenge, 
as they only reveal themselves when you land from your somersault cloud and approach them closely. Don't be fooled by their appearance. While these Poison Chief bosses aren't the toughest foes, their poison bombs can deal devastating damage. The real danger comes from the explosions that follow their attacks, which can catch you off guard. It's best to take a cautious approach, evade their strikes, wait for an opening, and then unleash your attacks before backing off to stay safe. Yeah! <laughs> 
The giant Shigandang is the largest boss in Black Myth Wukong. Its presence is cleverly obscured, both by the intricate environment and the necessity of collecting several hidden items from previous chapters. The giant Shigandang only spawns in Chapter 6 if you have collected the four Skanda items in the first four chapters. In order to keep things spoiler-free, I won't say more about the Skanda items right now, but if you want to find out how to collect and use the Skandas, check out my link in the description below. This colossal foe cannot be tackled in a traditional manner due to its immense size. Instead, you'll need to position yourself at the edge of its arm's reach, skillfully dodging its shockwave attacks. Wait for the opportune moment when it rests its arm on the ground, allowing you to rush in. When that chance arises, focus your most powerful attacks on the blue crystals adorning its arms. Shattering these crystals inflicts massive damage. Repeat this strategy, and you'll see the giant Shigandang fall in no time. The Stone Monkey marks the initial stage of the ultimate boss encounter, yet it can be viewed as a distinct adversary. Similar to the battles against the Red Boy and Yaksha King, defeating this first phase grants you a checkpoint. This means that if you happen to fall in battle, you won't have to start over from the beginning of the fight. Taking down the Stone Monkey's first health bar should be relatively swift and straightforward. His attacks mainly consist of standard swipes, but be cautious of his ground-pounding move, which sends shockwaves that you'll need to jump over. Things take a turn for the challenging in the second phase. The Stone Monkey unleashes a rapid and fierce expanding ring of fire that then retracts back towards him, requiring you to dodge it twice. Once he reaches a certain health threshold, he splits into two separate Stone Monkeys that attack at the same time, one wielding fire and the other frost. Additionally, trying to immobilize either of them will trigger their most devastating area of effect attacks right away. The strategy here is to concentrate on one monkey at a time. With the Jingu Bang in hand, build up to four focus points and unleash them to inflict significant damage on the monkeys.
The Great Sage's Broken Shell marks the second phase of the Stone Monkey battle, kicking off right after you take down the Stone Monkey in the Birthstone region. The good news is that once you conquer the Stone Monkey, you won't have to face him again. If you happen to fall to the Great Sage's Broken Shell, he will still be waiting for you when you respawn, allowing you to restart the second phase each time. In essence, the Great Sage's Broken Shell is a manifestation of Sun Wukong himself, or at least a part of him. This opponent mirrors your armor, spells, stances, and abilities, employing them in rapid succession to try and overwhelm you. Expect clever tactics like sneaky uses of rock solid and a flurry of heavy attacks executed through various stances. Once you deplete the Great Sage's initial health bar, you'll enter the second phase of the battle. In this stage, you'll lose access to Sun Wukong's special heavy attack and the ability to accumulate a fourth focus point without it diminishing. However, the overall dynamics of the fight remain largely unchanged. One key aspect to keep in mind is healing. If you use your gourd at a certain point, a scripted event will occur where the Great Sage snatches your gourd, takes a sip, and then hands it back, resulting in a loss of one gourd charge while he gains a bit of health. It's a neat moment, but it's not a major concern as long as you have a gourd stocked with healing charges.
You must have heard tales about him. Some say he helped Tung Monk fetch the scriptures, was granted Buddhahood, and stayed on Mount Lingshan thereafter. Some say it was not him who was granted Buddhahood. The real him was already dead on the journey to the West. Some say that the journey never happened. He is nothing but a monkey who lives in some storyteller's tall tale. <laughs> but now, you will hear a tale which no one has ever known. Erlang is a very special boss, perhaps the most special boss in Black Myth Wukong. Many people call Erlang the secret ending of Black Myth Wukong, because this is by far the hardest boss fight in the game. To put it simply, you need to have received all four vessels, and also defeated the green-capped Marshalist in Chapter 3, in order to tackle Erlang in Chapter 6. And yes, Erlang is the toughest challenge that Black Myth Wukong has to offer. Erlang has a poise meter, which allows him to resist most attacks until you wear him down. He has very long combos, hits hard, uses unpredictable timings, and can automatically sidestep your most powerful charged heavy attacks. He also goes through three phases during this one health bar. In the second phase, he gains a plethora of very powerful and unpredictable lightning-infused attacks featuring different weapons, including an axe and a sword. And in the final phase, he gains the ability to create duplicates of himself to shoot beams at you before sending a barrage of projectiles towards you. Here are some pointers for this tough encounter. The plantain fan can be a game changer in this battle, helping to chip away at Erlang's poise meter. Plus, the flower prime soak in your gourd will clear the shocked status effect whenever you drink from it.
Also, don't forget to collect the Jingubang from the Water Curtain Cave before you take on Erlang. It's the most powerful weapon in the game. And keep in mind that if you transform, Erlang will shift into a white tiger for a powerful leap attack. If it connects, you'll revert back to your original form. Avoid this attack, and he'll change back, giving you the chance to utilize your transformation effectively. The Azure Dust transformation works wonders against Erlang, as he tends to let you attack without much resistance. However, I find this tactic a bit unsatisfying, as it feels somewhat unfair. That's it. I won't hold back from now. Well, let's fight! My spirits, monkey. When he was dragged to the execution yard, sword and spear were dulled, cleaver and cudgel were crumbled, and yet he emerged unscathed. It gave his life to put you in this place. <laughs> Let me see you at power, divert from his. Yeah! 
satisfy my spirit. Go back with me to the sky. Let us get drunk before we continue this fight. While the Four Heavenly Kings encounter is technically the second phase of the Erlang boss fight, I view it as something special. The three phases of this grand endgame battle are so varied that they truly deserve to be seen as separate challenges. While the first phase is by far the toughest, the Four Heavenly Kings phase feels more like a victory lap than a tough battle. You may be outnumbered and facing a flurry of attacks, but each king's hit does very little damage. Plus, every heavy attack you perform in your kaiju form helps you recover some health. Keep that in mind. Focus on one king at a time, and soon you'll have them all defeated. And make sure to enjoy the spectacle. It's quite a sight to behold.
Erlang Shen marks the intense climax of the Erlang battle, kicking off automatically once you conquer the four heavenly kings in the earlier stage. At this juncture, Erlang re-enters the battle, revealing his true form to match your colossal stone monkey appearance. The stakes are higher here compared to the fight with the four heavenly kings, as Erlang Shen delivers significantly more powerful blows and can keep you in a stun lock if you forget to dodge. However, the fight itself is relatively simple. Focus on unleashing as many attacks as you can, utilize rock solid to counter his strikes, and don't forget to heal yourself with heavy attacks. Midway through the encounter, a scripted event will occur where Erlang Shen unleashes a fiery breath that will deplete your health, but don't lose your cool, because following this cutscene, you'll miraculously regain all your health. And from that moment on, your attacks will inflict even greater damage. So if you reach this point, Erlang's defeat is imminent.
I hear tell this Yagua is I rank a thousandfold about that king. As his sire, he reveres me, and like a deity, he serves me. How dare you think I'm his slave? Kindly chant the loosening spell and release that, Tathagata, so that you can take back my headband and I can be free. The court the Yagua. That Yagua said he knew this somewhat. Surely he is no mere mortal. <laughs> he must be somebody from the court. Great. The journey ends here. The desire is wide to bring me to watch me rip it off and break free. Tested you at my behest. All oh, for this day. And only now do I understand that fight. No prestige can shackle him. No band can keep him caged. A mortal death for an unbound mind and will. May you not. I'm now at peace. Your journey, though, has just begun. Say, what's to come of destiny if he steps out of that mural? <laughs> I make a living by reading what was written. The signs alone tell what's to come. What's to come is what's not yet written. No one can read what's not written. Destiny is written. In what's done. What's done shapes what's to come, not escape. <laughs> it's all written for me, if only I uncover all that occurred. So? Hmm? There really is something even you cannot read. <laughs> That's good. Very good. 